Okay. Good evening, good evening, ladies. Good My evening. Name, yes. Um, could everyone please mute your devices unless you will be speaking. So not to be rude to any of the speakers that we have. So once again, thank you, ladies. Thank you, gentlemen, who have uh, chimed in on this session today. We are talking to three dynamic survivors of breast cancer. Today's session is called, Ask Me How I Survived Breast Cancer. Oh, all righty. Thank you. And before, let me go back. And before we go on to the speakers, I would like to just share the stats from 1975 up until now, 2021, there's a huge difference. There's a decline, whether the decline is in the change in our diet or in the food or in the research. If you notice in 1975, it was one out of the 11 women would acquire breast cancer. In 2021, it is one out of eight. But I must mention that men can acquire and can get breast cancer as well. But since this session is just on women, that's who we're going to talk about right now. But ladies, also make sure that you talk with your men, especially if it runs in your family. So without further ado, I would like to bring to you our first speaker. Her name is Joanne Muldrew. And in 2010, she was diagnosed with labular. Okay, I'm not gonna even mess that name up. I will let her tell you the name of the breast cancer that she was diagnosed with in 2010. Joanne? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Joanne Muldrew and in 2010, I received the devastating diagnosis that I had breast cancer. My initial thoughts were, this couldn't be happening. Why me? How will I tell my family? And even though these were scary times, I came to grips with what was happening because when I looked at the statistics back at that time in one in five women um, was listed as having breast cancer, I have four siblings, that means of the, five, of the five girls, why not me? I look at my sisters and I said, would I want any one of them to have this? And the answer was no. So I began to make a plan of action as to how I would tackle this. Just like you have other catastrophic news of things, you plan how to get around it. You may go through this valley but eventually you find your way out. And that's how I looked at this. Um, the real work started with prayer and belief that I could overcome this. Um, I had a biopsy, the diagnosis was confirmed, and then I told my family. I didn't tell them initially because I wanted to make sure that I knew exactly what I had and what I was telling them. So I had to do my own research uh, before I tried to pass the information on. Um, telling the family was not as difficult as I thought it would be uh, because basically they supported me 100%. Um, when I began my treatment, they were there every single time. And I must also say, I was living in Fort Worth, Texas uh, when I received this diagnosis. My family was here in Arkansas. So once the diagnosis was accepted, planned for, we, be we began the treatment phase and we immediately decided that there, I would have a single breast uh, mastectomy, I would need chemotherapy, radiation, and reconstruction. 
So this was a plan uh, that was uh, worked out with a spectacular team of doctors. And I am grateful for all that they did to help me get through this. Yes, my family, my faith was important, but then having doctors and nurses, staff who cared about your well being made it a lot easier to get through this. Once I started, um, the mastectomy was over with. Yes, you had the scars of that. But then there was chemo, the poison. And this was probably the most difficult part of this whole process because at this point, this is when I experienced hair loss. My brother-in-law did the cutting of the hair, shaving my head. So once I got through that again with prayer, with family, friends supporting me, I got past that loss because it was devastating. And for me, that was the hardest part, losing my hair. After chemo, there was radiation. And to me, this was probably the easiest. People go through all of these challenges and you have different experiences. And probably the radiation, even though yes, you burn whatever, but it was nothing like the previous. So um, probably that was uh, the less um, of all the cutting, poisoning and everything else that you go through. Once I completed the radiation, I did not immediately uh, go into reconstruction. Uh, I waited until I was completely healed and it was probably almost two years before I actually went into the reconstruction process. And again, I had the support of my family. Uh, I can also re remember my niece. She was big on affirm positive affirmations. And this helped me to stay focused and to know what I needed to do. So along with that, getting through that process. Nutrition is a big thing because when you're going through the different phases, your appetite is not always good. The food, your taste buds um, take on a different flavor than you normally would experience. And my thing was, I have the best cook. My sisters are the best cooks this side of the Mississippi. So I knew I had good food before me and I ate it. It may not have tasted like it used to, but I knew it was good and that it was good for me. Therefore, I ate. I did not experience um, the nausea, throwing up, none of that. So yes, Having the family there supporting you, taking care of you, uh, helped me through the process. You once going through that, you also have periods of dehydration. Um, you know, and they tell you that you must drink uh, so many fluids of li liquids, and that can be a combination of protein drinks, water, juice, whatever. But if you do not do that you will become dehydrated. And once you become dehydrated, you will get sick. So the important thing was once I did that and I did have, I did get dehydrated, I knew what was happening to me. So then I also made sure that I was drinking adequate water and fluids. Again, family support, prayers, colleagues, they were all there. Um, cheering for me, rooting me on, um, uh, giving me positive affirmations. So it made me want to try harder. Want, want it, it made me try to be better at the task ahead, whatever that was. And again, I have to say that I had a great medical team of uh, medical professionals. Um, they basically took care of me um, whole body and soul. Each time I saw a physician, they asked how I was feeling, 
pain, emotional well-being. So once you know they're all looking to take care of you, it helps you to get through. It makes you want to do better. Uh, it helps you to get through those hard days. And there were some. So it's not an easy task. And you definitely have to be pre mentally prepared. When I say mentally prepared, that means yes, you've got to know what's ahead. You accept the challenge and you, man you move forward. You also must plan uh, for everything that's going on ar around you to help you. Um, if you lose sight of the task at hand, then you're gonna fall along the way. So again, surround yourself with positive people, um, making sure that you're on track and that you're reaching your goals. Uh, I am grateful um, to have had the experience of family coming together and rallying for me. And I, I can't say enough about them, the way they took care of me. And again, traveled from Arkansas all the way to Fort Worth, Texas. So that was very meaningful. And again, faith, the prayers. I can remember um, a friend of mine, actually she was a friend of my sister. It was a button that said prayer changes thing. I put it, it was a magnet. I put it on my refrigerator and it gave me hope. Um, every day because then I had to silently uh, go through with these, the prayer ritual. And I can't say you know, enough about having that firm belief that you can get through it. So I've been through the valley, didn't stay, I'm out. I am now cancer free, 10 years. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. And again, although there were challenges, um, you know, it is a battle. And I, I believe that I won. So I look forward to making a difference in my community and the people that I come in contact with. And if I can be of assistance to others, I will be there. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Auntie Joanne, for sharing with us um, at the end of our uh, presentation, um, we will open it up for people to ask questions and the ladies know I have one question for all of them to answer. So next, let's go here. Okay, where is that? Sorry, I promise you, <laughs> I'm gonna get it together one of these days. There we go. Okay, so our next speaker will be a lifelong friend of mine that I have been knowing for over 40 plus years. Her name is Gloria Cotton Chairs. Gloria, please unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting up here waving, okay. <laughs> Good evening. It is, you know what? It's making me smile to see so many people coming on to this uh, Zoom. Uh, welcome all. But as Cassandra was saying, Cassandra and I have been grade school friends from what the fourth grade, I want to say, mm. up until now. So for 40, 35, 40 plus years. My journey of breast cancer started um, October 2018. My sister and I, as a ritual, every year, we would plan our, our mammogram. So we took it on a regular basis. Um, this one particular time, we couldn't get them together. My appointment was at three o'clock, her appointment was at 4.30. Uh, normally we go together hand in hand and she's outside waiting on me and I'm waiting on her. This one time we couldn't go, so, she was at work and I could get off early. So I'm like, I'll take the three o'clock appointment. So I went up there, big bed. I'm dressed in a cup, let's do this. And um, 
the tech, when she, after I did it, she said, um, let me take another picture of your left breast. And I'm like, for what? It looked the same way it did last year. What's the problem? And she said, okay, she did the, did the other, did another picture. And that was it. Um, literally by six o'clock that evening, my doctor called me. And his exact words was, you need to take another mammogram. We saw a spot. He didn't cut, he didn't beat around the bush straight forward. You need to take another one. Uh, I'm like, okay. He said, I said, well, when do I have to take another? He said, uh, I've already scheduled this for tomorrow. I'm like, well, I just be down. And I got up the next morning. Um, no, that evening I told my sister, I said, girl, Dr. Keiko called me. She said, for what? I got to take another mammogram. And she said, it's nothing. I'm like, I know. I already knew it wasn't nothing. So I got up the next morning. I went over there. I took the next mammogram. Same thing happened. Doctor called me the next day. Uh, after I took the mammogram, he called me. I think it might have been four hours. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, we think it's cancer. I'm like, OK, you need to go for a biopsy. I'm like, OK, so when are we doing this here? So now I'm getting nervous. OK, so now I'm telling my sister about it. Now I'm tell I refuse to tell my daughter about it at this point. Uh, but I tell my sister about it. And she's like, well, go, go. We'll see. It'll be OK. That was our favorite word. It'll be OK. It'll be OK. Well, we're going to go for about two weeks. It was cancer. It was with the, it was called triple negative, which is a very aggressive breast cancer. And I was in stage one and a half going into my second stage. It wasn't quite large to say stage two, but he said one and a half going into two. So it was triple negative. So it wasn't a matter of um, put off nothing. It was a matter of, now we got to figure out what we're going to do. So my doctor kind of took the rims. He was like, okay, your next appointment is at Loyola Hospital. And this is when we're going to get a team of doctors. You're going to pick which team you want. Then we're going to get, you need to get a port put in. He just told me stage by stage. And I was taking all this stuff in and I was telling, trying to relay it to my sister. And she's like, no, this is not going to work. So then I'm like, well, we have to tell my daughter. So got my daughter together uh, and my sister. Then my brother, like, what y'all do? What y'all doing? Y'all doing something. Y'all being sneaky. So now my brother's coming in on it. So my son, he was in California. He was the last one to know about it because I did not want him to try to fly home. But um, next thing I know, I was getting the port put in. Uh, I had talked with my daughter. They did the BRCA test uh, because my next concern was, was this heredity? I had a daughter. I had a sister. I had a brother. I had a son. And my main thing was, now that I have it, how do I stop or how can I protect my family, anyone in my family from getting it? So I did the BRCA test and it came back. It wasn't genetic. So I'm like, well, how in the hell did I get it then? And my doctor said, well, it just happened. I'm like, yeah, right. It would happen to me. So they put the port in and they were like, okay, we're going to start your treatment. I'm like, okay, what kind of treatment? So now I'm sitting down with the team of doctors, which I had an excellent team of doctors. I, I love all my doctors. Dr. Lowe was the best. But they told me step-by-step step how much chemo I was going to have to have. They told me I would have to have surgery. They told me I would have to have radiation. So me not being a doctor, <laughs> I'm like, can you just cut the breast off and call it the day? My doctor's like, uh, no, that's not how it worked. I'm like, why not? If, you, if the cancer's in the breast, cut it off, we be through. He's like, no, 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 girl, yeah. We have to go through these stages. We can cut the breast off if that's what you want to do. But either way it go, you're going to go through chemo, you're going to go through the surgery, and you're going to go through the radiation. Now, what we're hoping that when this all is over, this is done, you would not have to have your breast removed. And I'm like, oh, okay. I said, but you're hoping, I said, no, I'm not having my, if, if you're not going to remove it now, you're not going to remove it later. So this is the only opportunity you're going to get to remove it. He's like, okay, then no, we're not removing it. So chemo was the worst. I have never in my entire life thought 
I would go through anything like chemo. 28 sessions of chemo. Poison being injected into your body. And every, not sometimes, every single chemo treatment I had, I was nauseous, throwing up. They had to clean the port out, flush the port out. And every time I threw up, naturally when I went in, every time I had chemo treatment, they just gave me the little tub thing that you throw up in because they knew what I'm going to throw up instantly. Time they start cleaning up, pushing out the port, I was going to throw up. Then that was going to mm -hmm. last for about 30 minutes. Chemo lasts about three and a half, four hours. Uh, but the one thing I can tell you about chemo, it was the worst in my life. But I tell you, I never did a chemo treatment by myself. When I say my family showed up and showed out, my friends showed up and showed out. I don't care how weak I was, or how sick I was. I mean, people that I didn't even want to see me throwing up. You know, you don't want to, everybody don't need to see you throwing up. Everybody saw me throwing up because it was not one chemo treatment that I went to by myself. And it was not one chemo treatment that I went through without throwing up. Um, so the support was awesome. My daughter, she would bring her laptop, her blanket. I'm like, okay, who's getting chemo? Me or you, you getting real relaxed. She had a laptop, blanket, a book. Okay, and I'm doing chemo, but she's relaxed and comfortable. But my sister, my brother, my friends, they were there. I, I, I love them for being them. And like I said, I never went through a chemo treatment by myself. Radiation, the, no, the surgery came after the chemo and they went into my lymph nodes. They didn't have to remove the breast. It had not spread it to my lymph nodes. Thank God for that. And from there, after the surgery, I had radiation. I had heard about radiation. They said it burned you, but I'm thinking, burn me, okay. First radiation treatment, nah, no problem. Second, nah, no problem. Third, nah, all the way down to maybe the 10th treatment, I had no problem whatsoever radiation, but it drains you. When I say drain you, it's draining. I mean, I was tired every day and I think I was doing radiation um, weekly, every day, daily for only thing they I had off was Friday, I want to say, and they didn't even want me to have that day off, but I did, it continues, but it takes all of your energy. Now, well, by the time I got to my 10th or 11th treatment, my arm, my underarm got sore. Um, and, my, and my radiologist, Dr. Small, he was like, yeah, you may start feeling a little burn. It, your skin is gonna burn, it's gonna get darker. I'm like, oh, okay. Still, nothing had happened. It was just sore. By treatment number 12, I was raw. Two treatments later, I was raw. When I say raw, I was white all up under my arm, my breast, all of that was just literally peeling. And it had gotten so dark. Um, I had mismatched boobs. One was lighter than the other. And my left boob was like dirt black. And I'm like, oh my God. But when it, the skin started burning, then I started getting white. And it was to the point where you couldn't even lift your arm up. That's how bad I burned. And I had got to the point where I would just take a paper towel and put it up under my arm just so I could let my arm down because I was literally raw. That was so painful to me. I, I, I couldn't do anything ever to get dressed, to put on clothes. It was just unbearable. It, it was unbearable, but I got through it. I got through it because my brother, my sister, my sister-in-law, my daughter, I got tired of them, but they were still there. Whether I got tired of them or not, they, they didn't go anywhere. But um, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy what I went through. But I tell you, I give a testimony because it was nothing but a test and I passed it. And that's the one thing I could say. If anyone had to do it within my family, I'm glad it was me. I am. I don't know whether my sister, my daughter, or anyone else would have survived it. But I went in it not thinking, am I going to survive it? 
I went in thinking, when this is all over and done, what am I going to do next? Because cancer was the least of my worries. I knew I was going to get through cancer because I knew one thing, if I didn't know nothing else, I knew God. And my God that made me so comfortable with what I was going through. Whatever discomfort, he, he comforted me. Whatever thought of negativity I have, he put a positive thought there. So between my family and my God, I was just looking to the end of it. I knew I, knew I was going to survive it. I was just waiting to get, get past my trials and my tribulations so I could see my victory and ring my bell. So Gloria, I have one question to ask you. What's that? What did you have to tell me about your hair? Girl, look, I hate my hair even now. Um, I lost all my hair, of course. And my brother told me, he said, because uh, when I first got diagnosed, I'm like, I'm going to lose my hair. I'm going to be bald head, look like Mr. Clean. I was all distraught at that point. He said, uh, why? I said, because this chemo going to take my, can my hair away from me. He said, chemo going to take it. I said, yes, chemo is going to take it. He said, why don't you take it then? Don't let chemo take your hair from you. You Chemo don't own you. Don't let chemo take your hair. Take your own hair. Cut your hair off your head. Do not let chemo take something from you that you want. If you, you want your hair, do what you want to do with your hair. Don't let chemo do what it wants to do. So you cut your hair. And I cried and I cried. And then the next day, I said, I, I, I asked my husband, I say, where are your clippers? And uh, he like, what you gonna do? I said, I'm gonna cut my hair. He said, no, you're not. I said, chemo not gonna take it. If somebody gonna take it, I'm gonna be the one to take it. Oh, so oh. then he got, I got his clippers and I just went down my head. I shaved myself bald and I started crying. Then I started crying. Then I started laughing. Then I called my brother. I said, Mill, I took my hair off. He's like, you didn't. And so I FaceTimed him. And he said, that's right, girl. Don't let cancer take your dog on here. You take it. And that's how I got control of it. I oh, right. it. It didn't control me. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you so much for sharing that story and not allowing cancer to take from you what it did give you. And that was your hair. I appreciate that. All right. So our last person but not the least person we are going to bring to you is a young lady that I have been knowing for, I would say about 20 years. Her and I both were in the military together and uh, we're in the same reserve unit. And so Yolanda, please share your story. You gotta come off a of mute. Okay, you can't find your mute button. There she goes. Okay, so sorry, I hit something on my computer and you all went away for a moment. Hello everyone. <clears throat> my name is Yolanda Powell and like Cassandra said, uh, I think she was one of the very first people I met uh, after joining the military. Uh, besides the other lady in this picture, I'm not, I'm gonna call her out, Sophia. Um, hey, Sophia. So unlike Miss Joanne and Gloria, um, my battle with cancer started this year. Um, I got a, I found a lump when I was uh, cleaning water out of my basement and I knew that it wasn't a normal lump because I have fibrous uh, breast tissue. So I've been getting mammograms since the age of 34 because one of my mom's uh, sisters um, had breast cancer and succumbed to the disease uh, almost 30 years ago now. Um, and so we all knew that we should you know, go earlier than wait till 40 to start getting mammograms. So my breast felt like I knew what they should look like. Um, so when I found the lump, um, I, I just, 
I didn't want to deal with it. So let's just say that out front. I didn't want to deal with it. So I waited a whole week before I, you know, called my provider and said, hey, you know, this is what happened. And so they're, they're like, you know, you can't schedule a mammogram if you have a lump or if you have discharge, you have to see your doctor first. And so, you know, they always tell you, call your doctor right away if you find a lump or if you have discharge so they can get you in right away. But that wasn't the case. Um, I got to my doctor right away, but in order to get a mammogram, they wanted me to wait um, almost four weeks. And I knew by the position of the lump and how it felt that four weeks wasn't going to cut it. So my journey took a turn because I switched doctors, hospitals, all of that in a matter of less than five days. So I went from advocate medical group to Northwestern um, here in Chicago. And by the time I switched, I had an appointment within 24 hours. Um, and two days later, I was having a biopsy. And then two, two more days later, um, I was getting a call saying, you know, it was positive for cancer. So I, like Gloria, was also diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. And it's very aggressive. So like she said, there's no time for you to sit and, you know, devise a plan. You just had to go straight into everything that had to happen. So uh, I think I ended up having another biopsy because it traveled to my lymph nodes under my left arm. So after that biopsy came back positive for cancer as well, um, I had to have MRI, CAT scan, bone scan, body scans. Um, I was rejecting getting a port in at first, but once they uh, explained to me that having chemo go directly into your veins would basically um, blow out your veins. So I had to get a port put in all before the end of April. So all this happened within uh, a matter of two and a half weeks that I had all those um, tests. So <clears throat> I started chemo at the end of April and I had 14 rounds. It was supposed to be 16 rounds of chemo, um, but because of uh, nerve damage to my fingers and my feet, uh, they stopped two sessions early. So I was done um, August of this year with chemo. Uh, they allowed me a little rest, but not much because during that time you're still seeing uh, somebody's doctor. So I was seeing a uh, plastic surgeon, uh, the breast surgeon and uh, genetic testing. I had to get that done as well. Luckily, my breast uh, genetic testing came back negative, so it's not genetic, thank God, because um, I have eight aunts, and I have a sister, and I have two nieces, and I have a son that I was concerned about whether or not it would run in the family, plus uh, a plethora of cousins, female cousins. Um, once the genetic test came back, I knew that I didn't have to have a mastectomy. So instead, I opted for a lumpectomy where they just take um, the, the lump or the area where the lump was, plus additional cells to make sure that it didn't travel anywhere else, in addition to taking some of the lymph nodes from underneath my armpit. Um, with that comes the the possibility of uh, experiencing lymphedema, which is what I'm experiencing now, where your arm swells up and it can travel from your arm all the way down to your hand. So be in therapy for that. And I start radiation um, tomorrow, actually. And I have to go five days a week um, for 20 sessions. So I don't know what radiation is going to be like. Um, I do know that I have a uh, very sensitive skin, so it's more than likely 
that I will get a taste of what Gloria was talking about with the burning. Um, they tried to prepare me uh, and by giving me some something to rub on me before and after the radiation. Um, so we'll see, but I'm still pushing through um, this diagnosis because my last mammogram showed that all the cancer had been uh, deleted through the chemo. So everything is moving in the right direction. Um, and I have to say that my mom is on the line and my sister, without my mom, um, I wouldn't be here talking about anything. Um, yes, I have the aquaphor. Um, she, my mom would make me eat even when I didn't want to eat, like Miss Joanne was talking about. Um, she would make me get out and go get fresh air, um, drink water, walk around just so I wouldn't become, you know, a victim of depression. And I would not be here without her. My, my friends would come over and bring food. And my one of my best friends would cut up fruit so we could make smoothies. And she put everything in the freezer so we wouldn't have to do anything but just grab and go. Um, my sister would bring water. She helped me set up my uh, lounge chair where if I didn't feel like going all the way up to my bed. Um, so like Joanne and Gloria, you need people all around you all the time. And unlike Gloria and Joanne, I couldn't have anyone with me during chemo sessions because of COVID. So I did all of the chemo treatments alone, except for the first one. So it's different when you're going through a pandemic. Um, you have to muster up a little bit more strength than the ones before you because you have to do it alone. But that's my story. It's still being written. Um, but that's, that's, that's my story so far. Okay. All right, Yolanda. Well, we are rooting and praying for you. Um, and I thank you for sharing it. Now I've seen Vicki, young lady named Vicki, my sorority sister come in. She is a breast cancer survivor. If she can give us like five minutes, not a long Please, not, not a long story, um, but just share some of how you um, made it through. Vicki, are you still on? I guess not. I think she dropped off, Cassandra. Okay, okay. Well, since she dropped off, let me go into the chat. Um, there was a question posed to Aunt Joanne wanting to know what was the the name of the type of cancer that you were diagnosed with? It was lobular carcinoma. Yeah, I couldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't have got that. Yeah, okay. Um, then someone else wanted to know, why do they refer to it as poison? Either one of you can answer it, Gloria, Joanne, or uh, Yolanda. Well, I put it in the chat um, because it can cause uh, not just tissue damage, just damage to your organs um, because of how strong and potent it is. So it's really called the red devil. Um, but yeah, because it's red and they have to administer it by hand. So it can't just go directly um, from the IV into your system. Someone has to push it in at a certain uh, speed uh, over a certain amount of time. Ooh, okay. And then someone else posed the question. Um, I guess this is to Gloria because you talked about your skin turning raw. What did you use to heal your raw skin? Uh, my doctor had prescribed a cream that I put on, which I had said I was going to share with Yolanda. Um, and it worked wonders. I actually used the cream for maybe four, three, four days before I actually noticed the difference. 
the comfort came back where I could put my arm down and my color started coming back. It was no longer dirt black. It had started coming back to uh, the original color. Okay. But um, to, uh, just to piggyback off of what Yolanda was saying about the red devil, you, you know what? Any form of cancer uh, chemo that you take, uh, it is poison. And it's there for a purpose. And the reason why, just like we, we need our red cells and our white cells. And the bad thing about chemo, when you inject it into your body, you don't know what's, what that chemo is going to kill, whether it be the white cell, which are, you know, your healthy cells or your damaged cells already. So we're taking, that's a gamble within itself when you start getting chemo, because yeah. it can kill off the good cells just as well as it kill off the cancerous cells. Absolutely. Okay, hold on one second. I need to stop this recording before I go on. Hey, Kim and McCall. I, had, <laughs> I saw them on there. Hey, Kim and McCall, thank you for joining. Okay, hold on.